Welcome to the Silicon Valley Podcast with your host, Sean Flynn, who interviews famous entrepreneurs, venture capitalists, and leaders in tech. Learn their secrets and see tomorrow's world today. CJ, welcome to the Silicon Valley Podcast. I'm super excited about today's episode. First off, I want to thank Ron Horry, who made this introduction. And because of that introduction, I mean, that's allowed everything today to happen. So thank you, Ron, for looking out for myself and supporting the show. But CJ, I mean, I did a ton of research on your background. It's pretty impressive. Our audience that's composed mostly entrepreneurs, venture capitalists, leaders in tech, they're going to love everything that we're talking about today because, well, it's centered to everything that they work on, centered to everything they do. So, I mean, I know your background, but could you give a brief background of your career up until this point before we really dive into those questions? Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Sean, for having me here today. It's my honor to be on your program Big shout out to Ron who connected us. Yeah, it's been quite the journey uh, that's brought us to today. Um, I'll, I'll work backward a little bit. I've had my own company, Gilbert Studios Website Design since 2006. I've been a full-time web developer since then. I first got into web design. It's no surprise to people who know me that I've been a computer geek pretty much all my life. I was the kid next door that you'd, you know, turn that the grandparents would turn to to set their VCR timers and, you know, that kind of thing. Right. So I've I've always been helping people with their computers. And I was in high school in 1995 when the Internet was born. And it was very natural for me to uh, I a friend of mine uh, in high school. Her dad owned a computer company and I ended up working for his company to help local businesses with their websites. And that's really when I started to get into it in, in 95. Did a couple other things through my college uh, and, you know, beginning career days. Uh, I was pre-med for a long time, which was fascinating. I learned a lot about all kinds of different things and got to uh, visit a couple different schools and different places around the country and facilities. And I actually lived in Moscow, Russia for six months uh, doing a medical program there. And it wasn't until I came back to the States and my uh, girlfriend at the time, wife now, asked me the magic question, hey, do you really want to be a doctor? And that was the first time anyone had ever asked me that question. And I was like, no, it's horrible. They they don't have any fun. They're always away from their family. They're miserable. They're on call 24 hours a day. It, you know, they work. The doctors and nurses work around the clock. It's it's miserable. So I became an entrepreneur. Right. But, you know, <laughs> but uh, seriously, I I. I, I feel very fortunate that my journey led me through so many different things. I first couple jobs, I was working in an office, I was filing, I was answering the phone. I learned a lot about customer service. I got into a banking for just a couple months and then I had an opportunity to transition into insurance and I ended up working for Geico Direct. I was one of the guys that, you know, you want to save 15% or more and you call them in. I was one of those guys answering the phone and providing that quote and helping people with their auto insurance. I went from there to work for AAA, uh, Auto Club of Southern California selling auto and home policies. And I learned a lot about sales, studied a lot about sales during those years of my life and masters like Tom Hopkins and others that were teaching such great things about sales. And um, I got kind of tired of the sales pressure, right? The always the, the pressure to sell, 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 hit your quota, hit your numbers. And I was fortunate that I was able to kind of move sideways into an inspection job. So someone else was selling the policy and I would just get the notice that a policy was up for renewal or it was new. And I got to drive out to the house, take a picture. I had a Jeep Wrangler at the time. And I just, it was so much fun. I just got to drive all over San Diego and take pictures of houses and boats and cars and just super easy report. Yep, it exists. Click. Yep, they've got a roof. Yep, you know, all that kind of stuff. And it was one of those jobs I was inspecting a house and I'd already done the inside of the house, was headed out. They had a wooden deck and I was headed down the stairs to check out the foundation and there was a loud crack and I fell right through that staircase. And that's how I fell out of the insurance industry. And it's, it, you know, it was a hard road, right? There was a lot of pain. There was physical therapy. There was chiropractic. I messed up my back and my knee. And so that was, you could look at it as a tragedy. You could look at it as a really bad thing that happened to me. But that really was pivotal in, 
you know, through the conversations, they're like, well, CJ, you can't hike all over San Diego anymore right now, obviously. What else do you know how to do? And uh, I threw out a couple suggestions. Well, I speak German. They're all, nah, that's useless. What else you got? I'm like, how about sign language? They're all, nah, not really. And when I said that I knew how to make websites, they thought I, I had something there. And they paid for me to go enroll in a local uh, college. They had a program. What did they call it? Multimedia and technology design, I think is what they called it at the time. Went through that program, got that certificate, and basically opened my own business in 2006. And I've been a full-time entrepreneur ever since then. I had no idea you're a polyglot. <laughs> like your background, way more interesting than the research I had done. The time in Russia, <laughs> everything. Okay, so now since 2006, you're designing websites. I mean, the, the website itself, many people will say that's the number one sales marketing tool of a company, hmm. but so many companies, they just put something up there and then walk away. Right. I mean, what are your thoughts to that statement of the website is your number one sale, sell, sell, selling tool? Absolutely. Absolutely. I love the way that you phrase that. In fact, I'm going to add on top of it. Audience, if you hear nothing else I say today, hear this one thing. Your website is the only thing you can fully own and control online. It's so important. I'm going to say it again. Your website and your email list, but that usually comes through your website. Your website is the only thing you can fully own and control online. And isn't it true that every other platform out there is telling you to come to their platform and build up their website? And there's certainly value there. If you have potential customers there, of course you want to hang out there. You want to attract the customers you can from every platform. That makes sense. But you always need to remember, what are you growing on the back end? Are you growing someone else's thing or are you growing your own thing? So I love how you said that the website is your number one sales and marketing tool. And that's really what I teach people. You know, when I first got into business, I was uh, helping local businesses. I'm in the San Diego area. I joined a local networking group, started meeting other business owners. And really quickly, I discovered that most business owners know they need a website, just like you said, they get it, but they don't really know what to do with it or how to use it. And that led me to writing down some of my thoughts. And that's how I ended up writing a book. Five golden keys to sharpen your website. And I really, at that point, I didn't, I didn't intend to become an author. I didn't intend to become a speaker, but I'm, I'm so pleased when I finally realized that I had a message I could share with business owners. And that's what I do now is I, I work with business owners and entrepreneurs and I teach them to think of their website like a tool. Because if you think of it like a tool, you can use it specifically to attract more customers, to make more sales and improve your customer service. All of those things add up to help you save time, save money, and ultimately serve your clients better, faster, and easier. So everything that we talk about when it comes to your website, I'm looking at it in two ways. I'm looking at it about how it can serve you as a business owner and entrepreneur, but even more, how it can serve your customers, your client, and what they get out of it. So thinking of it as a sales tool is amazing. The first question we ask people when we start talking about their website is what is their goal for their website? And I used to get a lot of blank looks right then, a goal for my website. I don't even know what that means. And we would start talking about it. Well, do you want to use it to make sales? Do you want to use it for education? Do you want to use it for customer service? You want to share resources? You want to provide, you know, what are you looking to do? And then, and that would make some light bulbs go off. And that's, you know, really what became part of my book. So just recognizing what it is and how you can use it really then begins to tell you how you should begin to use it. So if I'm a brand new startup, I have this idea, I just raised some funding, or, or maybe maybe the funding is going to be six months down the line, but I have this idea of a company I want to start. We're in stealth mode. We're about to launch our website. You'd mentioned, you know, think about your website in many different ways. How should I, from day one, we don't have the product yet. We just kind of want to get our message out there. We just want a placeholder. How should we, from that, that very moment, start thinking about that website? And then maybe how should we start thinking about that website as we grow mm -hmm. from that idea to now we've raised some funding or we're going out to raise some funding. Now we have a few employees. We found product market fit. Now we're really scaling. Like, I mean, I guess that's two questions there. So first question, before we even launch our product, our company, what should we be thinking about the website? 
Great, great question. So I would say, I would encourage you to think of your website as a tool that grows and develops and evolves with your business. And you and I both know that what you think your business is going to be on day one that you open the door may not be where it is weeks, months, years down the road, it'll probably change. It'll probably grow. As you interview more of your clients and customers and they tell you what they really want, you're going to adapt to that. Recognize that your website as a tool is flowing and growing with you. So on day one, what you need it to do is going to be different than what you need it to do three months later, six months later, and just give yourself the freedom to allow your website to be whatever you need it to be today and allow it to change and grow as you develop further. Okay, now now the company's growing and developing. You've gone from the idea, you've just raised $5 million, you have 20 employees, you're scaling, things are going great. How does that website grow as the company grows? Absolutely, absolutely. I'm always going to refer back to these, these two things, and I said it before, but I'm going to say it again. Uh, the two most important questions where I want people to start are, what are the goals for the website? You know, just like I mentioned. And then the second question is, who is your target audience? Who is that demographic? The more you can identify that, and it, it doesn't matter which specific uh, pieces you identify as long as you're identifying some specific pieces. And this is different for each type of business. So I'm just going to give some generalities and you'll know what's right for your business. It could be uh, the, the geographic area where your customers live. It could be that you're serving more male, more female. It could be ser you could be serving more married people or single people or divorced people. You could be appealing to a particular uh, education level or a particular financial level. Uh, none of these are wrong or right answers. It's all about who are your people. I'm always thinking about your people. When someone hires me to work for them, they are my clients, certainly. But even more so, I feel like their client is my client. And even as they're telling me what they want out of their website, I will argue back with them on behalf of their client. What does their client want in the website? Because to me, that's the most important piece. So getting back to your question, as your business grows, let your website grow and continually ask yourself, what else could my client want from me, from my website? And think of it in terms of sales and customer service. I feel if we dial it into those two categories, it really helps us talk about it the most. So let's start with your sales. People, you mentioned this as, as your number one sales tool, and I could not agree with that more. I think a website is such a magical thing because people... Isn't it true that people are, I, I say that people are the strangest animal. I wear this silly hat, by the way. I don't know if your podcast audience can, <laughs> will be able to see any of this uh, via video, but I wear this hat and I call myself the web safari guide because the internet is a jungle and people feel lost and they feel like they're wandering down the wrong path and they're just not getting where they want to go. And I'm positioning myself as the guide to help lead them through. So a lot of my messaging involves the jungle and animals and me wearing this silly hat. So people are the strangest animal. And isn't it true that when you when you want to do something, accomplish something, you feel like you need to do a certain amount of due diligence. You need to do a certain amount of research to make yourself feel like you're making an educated decision about something. And so immediately when people are presented with an opportunity about you or a company or a service, they're going to go to the website so that they can fig they can do some research and figure out what they need to figure out, they, whether they whether they know what that is or not, they feel that need. Well, here's us on the other side. We get to create your website. We get to put whatever information we want on it. So here's this person that wants to find something, and here's us setting that something right out there for them to find. It's a perfect match. So people, they want to do this due diligence, but they're also really lazy. I mean, a lot of times, right? So having a website where you gather all of that resources together for them it just it just zings all the bells at once because they can immediately go to that one place. They can find what they need. And it is a sales opportunity, but it's a really low pressure sales opportunity because chances are they're in their own home, their own office. They're very comfortable. They're doing that research. So in the, they're they're in a mindset that doesn't feel like they're being sold to. Isn't it true when you're in a sales meeting, you put up your wall of resistance, you know, they don't feel that because they're in their own place doing their research. 
So they feel more open to receive who you are. And this is the number one piece to drive sales through your website. People choose the familiar. People choose the familiar. So we want people to come to your website and become familiar with who you are, what you do, the people you serve, why they love you. And that's the stuff that's really going to stick with them. And the more that they learn about you and the more they get to know you through clear videos, photos, uh, examples of your customers, testimonials, testimonial videos, the more they encounter those things, they're going to develop this familiar feeling for you. And when they're ready to make that buying decision, they're going to rely on that feeling. Now, we used to think that people made a buying decision based entirely out of logic and facts and reason. And we know now that's not true at all. We make our buying decision entirely based on how we feel about something, and then we justify it with the facts. On your website, you can do both. You can do absolutely both. Definitely give them those facts, the figures, the numbers, the data, but then also let them get to know you and become familiar with you. That's when it syncs together and they make that buying decision, hopefully to do business with you. I, I can't agree more. There's so many people that honestly, I've only met virtual through listening to their podcast or their videos and then I've met them and I think we've known each other for you know years when really it's the first time we've talked, but I just listened to the, their voice for so long. So it's crazy how much of a connection you can build with someone or, or something virtual through content on people's websites while you're, once again, at your own home mm -hmm. with your guards down, you're open to it. I mean, just the amount of research that I do right now before I make any purchases it's ridiculous how informed I am actually on these products where, you know, in the past you would have to sit down with a salesperson to get any of that information. Now you come to the sale already knowing so much in advance. So yes. we, we talked a lot about the website, but when you're a startup, maybe you don't have that team that can build it. Maybe you don't have all those people. So maybe you want to hire someone like yourself, a developer. Mm -hmm. How do you mm -hmm. go about finding that person that's the right fit for your company, especially that early stage startup when it could just be two founders and that's it. Yeah. Great, great question. And this is something that I see people struggle with because when you don't know about a particular topic, you probably don't know what questions to ask. You don't even know what to look for and how you choose that person. So I would say that it comes back to asking for recommendations, looking to people who have gone before you, see who they've met. Um, certainly, certainly a, a directory sites that allow you to read reviews and, and see how many stars people have. All of those are valuable resources. I would, I would recommend you use LinkedIn, I'm not a huge fan of Yelp for, for this reason or that. They're, <laughs> Yelp is just, if you're starting a business, Yelp is going to pound you constantly to, to be one of their advertisers and pay them money. So that's not necessarily why they're, they're, you know, that's probably why they're not my absolute favorite. But there's a lot of tools out there like LinkedIn. LinkedIn is an amazing place where you can go and you can make connections with people. You can read recommendations on people. And that's what you want. You want referrals, recommendations, see some work and be able to make a decision based off of that. And the other thing that I'll say is it's challenging because in this day and age, someone could pronounce themselves a web designer and hang out a shingle and you may not know any differently, whether this is, you know, day one of their web design business or day, you know, 6 million, like in my case. So it's, again, if you can rely, if you've got any friends, if you've got people in other businesses that you trust, mentors, advisors, look for those recommendations and referrals of people that they've worked with. And I think that's probably the best way to go. Okay. The company's growing. At what stage do you switch from having an outside developer manage everything to having someone internally do everything? Great, great question. And of course, that's going to be different really for each person and their situation and their budget and their needs and their familiarity and comfortability using all these things. You know, one of the things we learn pretty quick in business is if you don't have the skills to do something, it's going to save you a lot of time and money to hire someone to help you with that versus struggling through it yourself. Now, that being said, there's certainly a lot of things I did for myself starting out 
because of that, I've got more time than I've got budget. There's a lot to that. And I've created a lot of tools and resources, which I'll certainly offer to your audience as well as anyone listening uh, about some ideas that you can use to get started. But I think what you'll find is that there's a couple different kinds of designers. There's those that are Well, let me say it this way. When I work with someone, I want them to take a global picture of what they're looking at. We talk about their goals and their target market. We begin to develop their website in in the idea of it's going to support their sales and it's going to support their customer service and it's going to be a tool for their business. And then there's another kind of designer that I really call more of an order taker. They're a nerd. They know how to run the numbers. They know how to, you know, put the HTML together, but they really may not be familiar with how that applies to business or how that improves your sales or your customer service. So those kinds of developers and designers, they'll be able to do the work, but they may not understand the hows and the whys behind it. And they'll need a little more instruction. They'll, they'll, they're the kinds of developers that they want you to give them the content, the pictures, the outline, the structure, and they'll put it into place. Whereas the, the people that I typically work with, they don't necessarily understand how those pieces come together. And so I lead them through that whole process to help them put it together. So you'll just find a couple different companies. You'll, you'll see both out there in the world and pick, pick the one that really is going to complement your needs the best. So then should you go with kind of that outline template, that wireframe of what you want it, or should you just sit there and go show me what you got? Yeah, it's always good to look at those referrals and recommendations if they've got a portfolio of work so you can see what what they've already produced and how you feel about that. Um, if you have an idea of what that wireframe should be and what those pieces should be, by all means, and again, the the material that I've put out there and I'm making available to you is all stuff you could jump in. And I've got a lot of resources I want you to take advantage of that'll help you get a clearer picture of what you want to put together. And that'll make you feel more informed and more ready and able to then create that website that's going to work for you. And again, know that it's going to change and grow. What you want it to be on day one is is different than what you want it to be a few months down the line and give yourself the freedom to let it be whatever it is today and grow and change. And the other thing that I hear a lot of people ask me is, well, what about Wix or Squarespace or Weebly or one of these places where you can just click, click, click and throw up a website today? And for for some people, that's the right answer. I would rather you take some action than no action. So if you want to jump on one of those sites, get yourself a website together, pick one of their templates, punch in some information that you have and put up a website, do it because that's better than having nothing. And the other mistake I I see people making is that they think they need to have this great, big, beautiful, polished, multi-page dimensional website all perfectly prepared before they ever go live with it. And I've seen a lot of websites crash and burn before they ever go live just because they were you know, designed to death almost. Give yourself the freedom to launch something imperfect sooner, knowing that you're going to grow it and improve it as you go. Yeah, I've seen so many founders that just months and months and months of nitpicking everything, spend thousands and thousands of dollars on a site, hours and hours when they should be developing their business, Mm -hmm. developing their product, and just crash and burn okay so moving from the website oh okay it's actually still with the website but all the companies nowadays many of them are yeah find us on instagram find us on twitter find us on tiktok where they have the you know the bells and whistles connecting here to the website with social media platforms all this how should websites and social media platforms how should they talk to each other Great, great question. Absolutely. I'm going to, I'm going to tie back to something I said earlier. Your website is the only thing you can fully own and control. So I want you to think of your website as your, your number one publishing platform. If you're going to put something out into the world, do it through your website. And I'm going to, I think I'm going to step sideways and come right back to this question for just a second, because I talked about those other platforms, Weebly, Squarespace, uh, Wix, a lot of places that you can just get a website and get going. 
do that. If that's, if that's on your plate today, do that, take action, and the web geek proves. But keep in mind that certain platforms allow you to own your website better than others. For example, I use software called WordPress and Joomla, and this is open source software that you can freely get and you can use to create a website, and you really can fully own that website. You can put it on host A or host B, or if you change your mind, you can pack it up and move it over to host C or D. That website belongs to you. You can move it around as you see fit. But some of these companies like the Wix, the Squarespace, the Weebly, the GoDaddy website builder, those things only work on those platforms. So if you decide you want to move away from that platform, you will have to rebuild your website in a different way. So that's another caveat I thought it was important to mention right now. Not only do I want you to own your website, I want you to own a website you can own. Does that make sense? So all that being said, you've got your website, you fully own and control it. Now what? How do we implement with social media? Well, social media is another great place to go find people that are looking for you, your services, your resources, your products. And I offer a course in social media, how to get started with it. And the number one thing that I teach is I want you to recognize that these are communities of people. Um, and another thing is, I, I get asked a lot is, which platform should I go after? Or the other one that I hear is, I, there's hundreds of platforms. I can't possibly do all of them all at once. And I say, great news to you then. Your, your potential customer, we talked before about your, your goals and then your demographic target, that, that specific person that you want to meet, chances are they're not on all the social media platforms. Chances are once you've identified who that person is, you'll be able to identify the maybe the one, the two, or the three platforms that that kind of person spends most of their time using. That's the platform to go after. Maybe it's Instagram, maybe it's Twitter, maybe it's Facebook, maybe it's one of those. The thing I want you to recognize is that these are communities of people that are mid-conversation. And I bet you, you would never jump into a room of people that is already having conversations and just start shouting at the room, hey, everyone, I'm here, buy my thing, buy my thing, buy my thing. I mean, how annoying is that, right? We hate that guy. Much better to move into this room of people, observe how they're communicating and interacting with each other, begin to recognize that it's kind of their own language in each of these platforms they're using their own language they have their own way of communicating get to know that become familiar with that first and begin to engage in the conversation in an open give and take kind of way before you ever reach anything that resembles a sales message it's about connecting with the people there building some relationships offering some resources and some value and then they're going to recognize, hey, this person's really helping me out. What else do they have to offer? What else can I find? And that's when you can begin to drip some of your other things in here. Oh, I've got a video about that. I've got a resource I can share with you about that. And guess where they're going to find all those resources, videos, and information? Right back on your website. And they may get into the habit of coming back to your website to see what else is new and what else you've got there. And oh, they can sign up for your email list. And oh, let's subscribe to your YouTube channel. So Yes, use all the platforms or the, the number one platforms where your particular customer lives and spends their time and then bring them back into your own platform, your own website, so they can continue to find that information and you can have max control of that. So say you start having a lot of people come to your website, a lot of traffic. What type of metrics should you be checking and who at your company should be checking it? Should it just be the CTO? Should it just be the marketer? Should the CEO know what's going on? Like who should really be monitoring what's going on and in what detail? Absolutely. Great question. Yeah, there's a lot of metrics and there's a lot of tools that you can implement into your website. Probably the number one of those is Google Analytics. They'll offer you a free tool, a free little piece of code that you can put on your page and they'll help you track your users. And you can get a lot of great information. You can find out which pages they're going through, which order they go through. You can find out what keywords they're using to find you. You can learn more about that person who's on your website. Are they on a desktop computer or are they on a mobile device? That might mean something to you. That might change how you're interacting with people or, 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 um, or how you want to present the information to them. 
You may find they're in a particular geographic area. You may find all kinds of things. So getting getting the uh, these base analytics into your site, I would absolutely do that from day one. Install that Google Analytics script. It's totally free from Google and watch your traffic. I wouldn't worry about it like a lot if there's not a lot of traffic or I would just observe what's happening. And it is interesting to see which pages that people go to. And the other thing you may find is people are not necessarily all coming through the front door. A lot of times people think I'm going to have a website. It's whatever, whatever dot com. And people are going to hit that when they come to my website. P possibly people are actually searching for something else. They're looking for some other kind of information. And that's when Google says, oh, you can find the answer to that question over here. Maybe it's not your home page. Maybe it's a blog article. Maybe it's your frequently asked questions page. And that's actually where they land on the website, get the information they're looking for. And if it's engaging enough and if they like you enough and if they feel good enough, they'll say what else is here and they'll start looking around. So getting back to your question, Google Analytics is a great way to get a picture of how people are moving around your website and what they're interested in, how they got there. And then absolutely, there's extra metrics that are going to help uh, people. For example, the sales team. If you're selling a product through your website specifically, there's additional scripts that you can use to find out if people are actually completing the purchase, landing on the thank you page. And you can add the Facebook pixel is what they call it to that page so that if you're running a Facebook ad campaign, Facebook can give you the full amount of knowledge about we're serving your ad to this number of people. And then this I'm moving my hands closer, by the way, if you're listening to on, on audio, the greatest number of people are going to see your ad and then a little bit fewer than that are actually going to engage with your ad. Fewer than that are going to come to your page, your landing page. Fewer than that are going to actually take your offer. And then fewer than that are going to actually complete the cycle, purchase your thing, and land on the thank you page. By implementing these, these metrics into your website, you're able to see what that is. You're able to see what those percentages are. And that then you can start to fine tune things. As you look at the numbers, you may want a little more engagement. So then you need to make your ad a little more attractive or your video or your photo. If they, if the people are coming to that landing page, but they're not doing anything further, well, that can let you know that maybe there's something else that you need to do on the landing page to make it more appealing. Maybe you want to get them started with a free offer or a demo or a trial of something before they actually get to the sales. So by looking at the metrics, you can see who the people are, where they're coming from, what device they're using, how they're working their way through the website, and then the actual uh, percentage of sales and conversions, which might also help you fine tune your whole sales process. Have you ever worked with a client, a customer where you've made little tweaks to the website, but yet it had huge results mm. for the overall business? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, great, great question, absolutely. There's a there's a couple things that we look at all the time. For example, as I was mentioning that that demo, that trial offer, that first steps, people are in a hurry when they're on the website. You know, sometimes we we pour ourselves a cup of coffee and we sit back because we're going to do that research. And, you know, when you're going to go to someone's website, you're going to spend some time there. That's you and me researching people for our podcast. But that's a different situation than someone who's hit Google, they're looking for something, they go to one website, do they find it? No, they don't. They come to another one, do they find it? No, they don't. They go to another one, do they find it? They're moving fast. You've got seven, eight seconds to capture their attention and deliver the thing that they want. So one of the most frequent changes that we make is by making that call to action really upfront and obvious what that is. Tell your customer, don't assume your cu customer knows what to do next. Tell them what to do next. Call us. Maybe the button says call us. Maybe it says contact us. Maybe you want them to fill out a form to, to see if they you know qualify for whatever your program is. I mean, it could be a little bit different. Maybe you want them to schedule a meeting with you. Maybe you offer a, a complimentary consultation. So tell your customer what are the first few steps of the process and then invite them to take that very next step. One thing, I mean, I'm an investment banker. I'm not doing this amazing podcast. And one thing that we've been hearing about, at least that's been brought to our attention a lot in the due diligence is cybersecurity, network security, hacking. I got to ask you as a website expert, 
I mean, what's going on there? Is there ways to prevent that? Yeah, great, great question. And we've seen a lot of that happen recently, right? The big companies have, are getting affected. Very recently, Amazon was uh, was hit and went down for a while. GoDaddy had a big hit uh, a couple weeks back, and a lot of their stuff was down. So certainly, no one is a hundred percent immune to it. But a couple a couple things I can share with you. A lot of times the websites that we're using are using software like WordPress or Joomla or one of these other systems. You want to make sure that software is kept up to date. They're constantly releasing software updates and security updates. And it's important that you have someone kind of in charge of your site to make sure it's getting a regular backup and it's getting regular software updates. That might be you, that might be someone in your company, that might be the website company that's helping you out. But updates and backups are hugely important for that very reason. You just never know what's going to happen. And I mean, websites, yes, there's a static page, but they're always evolving. What are the trends in the future for websites? What are you seeing? And at the very end, I'm going to ask you, hey, if we're all in the metaverse, do we need a website anyway? But, <laughs> you know, before that, what are you seeing as the, as the, the evolvement? of the future of websites? I think that that reminding yourself a lot that your website is a tool and it's here to serve your business is going to continually give you more ideas about how to better use that tool for your business. We've spent a lot of time talking about sales, but I'd love to just spend a moment talking about customer service because your website can be a tool for customer service as well. Jeff Bezos says the best customer service is if someone doesn't need to, your customer doesn't need to contact you, doesn't need to ask you a question, it just works. So with that in mind, I always recommend that people think of how their website can improve their customer service. What information are people looking for? And if you don't know, I say ask your receptionist. Ask that person who's picking up the phone every day and talking to people. She's going to know exactly what should go on your website because it's the same thing that people are asking her a hundred times a day. Where are you located? What's your address? Do you take credit cards? What's your hours? How do I get started? Where can I get this form? If you can move that information to your website, this is a win-win-win situation. It's a win for your customer because they can go right here and they can get the information they need right away. It's a win for your receptionist because she doesn't answer, have to answer that same question a hundred times. She'll still answer it maybe 10 times, maybe 20 times, but not a hundred. And it's a win for you as a business owner, because the more service that people are getting through your website, that means there's not a human person that has to deal with that. That means this is going to improve your efficiency and your productivity and the efficiency and productivity of your employees. And that is going to increase your profit. So by thinking of your website as a tool for your customer service, you can, you can help your customers, you can help your employees, and you can help yourself as a business owner. All right. Speaking of profit, going to go back to the whole investment banking thing. All right. So say I'm representing a, a client. We're about to go to market before I tell them or even before they come to me. Hey, let's get that website up to stuff. Let's maximize what the value of your company is. How do we go about doing that by making tweaks to a website? Mm, great, great question. I would like to begin by pointing out that this is a horribly confusing thing to talk about. I talk to people all day, every day about these different pieces of their website, and it is very confusing. You're going to hear some language that's used in different ways, or people are going to use this phrase or a couple phrases, and it could mean a couple different things. So one of the things I'm going to point out to you is about the, the three pieces of a mysterious puzzle people don't understand. And that is your domain name, your website hosting, and your email address. And the tricky thing is all three of those things could be provided to you through one company, or each of those pieces could be provided to you through a different company, and they're all linked together. So one of the things that's important to know, especially when you're looking to possibly sell your company and the website and assets with it, is you want to make sure all of those eggs are in your basket and you can own it and access them. So you'll want to know where your domain name is registered. You'll want to know where your website is hosted. Could be the same company, but it could be different. And then you also want to know where your email service is being provided. Again, 
could be the same company, but it could even be a third company involved in that. And you need to know like where that's set up. It typically begins with wherever your domain is registered. Let's, I'm just going to make it up. Let's say your domain name is registered at GoDaddy. You want to make sure that's in your account with your name and you have access and control of it, not in somebody else's account that you can't get to. That's going to create problems, especially when it comes time to sell the assets and transfer it to somebody else. So making sure you have full control of that is important. And then the website hosting and then the email setup, certainly. So making sure that you know where those pieces are and can access them, that's going to be a huge step to help you in that next process. And then again, um, feel free to interrupt if you had any other questions, but to get back to your main question about tweaks you can make, think about it again. Let's start with the sales. What tweaks can you make to improve your sales call to actions, having those clear cut steps laid out for your customer. This is a great moment. Uh, one of the, um, one of the sales, one of my sales mentors is named Eric Lothholm, and he teaches about a concept called staged selling, which I think is hugely important when it comes to your website. It's really important for every part of your business, but it's the idea of everything that you're doing probably takes multiple steps to achieve it. In other words, you don't meet someone day one and then say, buy my thing. There's probably a couple steps along the way. Maybe there's some sort of a qualification process. Maybe there's some initial information that needs to be gathered, whatever it is. So if you can identify what those steps are, then that actually frees you up. You don't have to bombard your customer with all of that at once. Just lead them to the next step. And your website is an amazing tool that can help you do that because you're able to send links to people specifically for those specific steps. So maybe on your homepage, maybe that is the first step, but that's going to lead them to whatever that next thing is, the free trial, the free offer. That's your, that's your uh, call to action for them right away. And then after that next process, maybe you have a meeting with them. Maybe you gather some information. What's that next step? They're going to need to do something else. Have a page on your site for that piece. So if you think of your sales process or really any process in terms of steps and stages, you can use your website as a tool to help you move your customer through each of those steps and stages without them feeling overwhelmed with all the steps. They can just focus on that one piece at a time. And before we wrap it up, I have to ask, what's the number one problem you see companies make with their website? Mm, the number one problem. I think the number one problem that I see companies make is to not view their website as a tool or rather they're not placing the importance on it. They, they probably line it up a whole bunch of other things, their website, their social media, their Facebook page, their Twitter, yada, da 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 right? Their YouTube channel. There's value in each one of those things, but I'm always going to put the website on the top because it's the only thing you can fully own and control. So, so the importance of that, I just can't emphasize it enough. And I would encourage companies to focus on their website as that tool that unlocks everything else. It helps you better serve your clients. It gives you a clear, clearer focus of which pieces to improve. For some, for some of the people listening, they may want to improve some of those sales things we talked about. For some people, they may want to improve their customer service things that we're talking about. And the other thing that we really haven't talked about a lot, except we've alluded to it, is how people find you through search engines. And having things like blogs and articles and content that you're publishing on a regular basis, podcasts, for example, this is the kind of content you can publish to your website on a regular basis. And people could be looking for that information. And if you have an article that answers their question, when they ask Google that question, they're going to end up on that article on your website. And that's how they found you in the first place. And now they're ready to begin your sales process. So those are the three pieces I think people should focus on your search, your sales, and your service. And your search really truly is all about the content and the value that you're providing to your customers. And CJ, we never really dived into the, the community you've built, all the things you're working on. Before wrapping up, tell our listeners a little bit what you're working on. 
Absolutely. Absolutely. I've got a ton of resources for you. If you want to learn more about me and my company, it's Gilbert Studios. Gilbert is my last name, G-I-L-B-E-R-T, Gilbert Studios with an S at the beginning and end. Dot com. That's where you can learn about my website design business. But if you want to get involved right away with working on some tools to improve your own website, I want to send you here, mywebsitesafari.com. Mywebsitesafari.com. This is a little video series that I created. It's got seven videos. They are each less than 10 minutes. And the idea is to go over all the principles that we've kind of gone over briefly here together. But it begins with those questions, your target demographic, your goals. I've got a worksheet there so you can ask these questions and work your way through it. And then we touch on your search, your sales, and your service, and a few ideas on how to improve each one of those things. That's where I would recommend that you go first. Check that out, mywebsitesafari.com. And then you're going to have questions after that. And that's when I want you to come to my other website, askawebgeek.com. Ask a webgeek. And that's my podcast. You can ask me any questions you have on your website, email marketing, social media, and more. So go to that one place, mywebsitesafari.com, and it's going to lead you to all the other places and many other tools and resources and videos that you can take advantage of along the way. Fantastic. We're going to have all that information in the show notes. Once again, I want to thank Ron Horry for making this amazing introduction. And for our audience out there, please connect with us at the Silicon Valley podcast.com and all our social media handles are Sean Flynn SV or the Silicon Valley podcast. If you're out there looking for a mid-market investment banker, mergers, acquisitions, growth, capital, secondaries, that's what I do. I'm not doing this podcast, but connect with me on LinkedIn, Sean Flynn SV, and you'll find out everything I'm working on. And with that, Let's wrap up today's episode of the Silicon Valley Podcast. And CJ, I want to thank you once again for taking the time to be on the Silicon Valley Podcast. Thank you so much, Sean, for having me. My pleasure.